Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and that'll be the launching pad for our, our lesson tonight. Thank you for the invitation to be with you. I uh, always enjoy coming here and uh, being a part of your uh, service, and I appreciate so much you inviting me to come and, and to speak to you. I'll say this as we get started into our lesson tonight. Some of you may think when I finish up with the lesson that uh, I've sort of singled you out. That some of you might even think I've been sort of, you know, behind the bush and been listening to you, uh, some of the things that maybe you said or maybe even be able to read your mind and know some of the thoughts that you had. And uh, I want you to understand that's not the case, okay? And no one's giving me the lowdown on anybody here, so don't think that. But the reason I make that statement is because what we're going to talk about tonight is such a common thing. And in some ways, it's a natural thing in all of our lives as we live a Christian life and as we struggle with this world and as we struggle with the physical issues like you know, in the announcements that, that we have in life. And sometimes we get to the point where we just want to give up. And I just want to encourage you a little bit tonight and, and help you. We've all been there, okay? We, we've been all, to, it, it can be in various ways. Some of us, we, we go through sickness or we go through disappointments in life and it seems like God doesn't hear our prayers. And sometimes it's easy to, to just get down on God and say, what's the use? And some people will even throw their hands up and say, I said, I quit. I, I, the Lord doesn't love me. Where is the Lord in the time that I'm, I'm suffering? Sometimes in the church, we get our feelings hurt and we get disappointed. Uh, people disappoint us within the church. And we just feel like, what's the use? Sometimes we may work in the church and do things in the church and nobody mentions it. It's not in the bulletin. It's not mentioned from the pulpit. It seems like nobody cares. So what's the use? Why keep doing these things? Sometimes in the church, we, we get in a class or we get in a ministry and it's like we're stuck with it. And we try and we try and real hard to get people involved in the ministry but it seems like we can't. And sometimes it seems like we're the only one that's really interested in carrying the load in the church. It's easy to just get worn down. It's easy to get disappointed and sometimes even to throw up our hands and say, I quit. Well, let's talk about that. We're going to start out in Hebrews 12. And the reason we're starting out in Hebrews is because Actually, this is why this book was written, folks, because the Christians in the first century had really gotten down, and uh, they were thinking about going back to the old Jewish way, and they were just sort of beaten and discouraged, and, and they were just ready to throw in the towel. They said, I, and none of this. And so the book is written to show them uh, how that this new law is a, a whole lot better than the old law, but it's also written... Uh, to encourage them and to strengthen them and tell them, don't give up. Don't give up. And there's not a better text in all the Bible than what we're going to look at in these first few verses of Hebrews chapter 12. So let's just feast on the Word for a few moments tonight and, and see if uh, we can learn a few things and maybe as well be courage, encouraged. We began in verse 1 of, of chapter 12, and, and notice how the writer there begins. He says, therefore, now you've been here long enough, you're the Wednesday night people, you've heard it. When you see therefore, you know that what is about to be said is because of what happened, just what has just been said. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, now, the question is, who would this great cloud of witnesses be? Well, he has said, therefore. So you go back to Hebrews 11. 
In Hebrews 11, we know that's the great chapter of faith. We read about men and women who were willing to die for the Lord. Men and women who shed their blood for the Lord. And yet, they didn't give up. They hung in there. And they stayed in the battle. And uh, the writer says, let me encourage you. Let me remind you people. You want to give up, you get tired, and you want to quit. Let me remind you that there were people. Think about Abraham, and think about Moses, and, and think about all these great people here in Hebrews 11 that went through things you would never go through. And they stayed faithful. In my mind's eye, I can sort of see it's like here we are in the arena of the Christian life. And we're dealing with the world, and we're dealing with brethren, and we're dealing with ministry, and we're dealing with everything else in life. And it's like surrounded, we are surrounded with this great cloud of witnesses, like we're in the, the Colosseum in Rome of had the privilege to be at that Colosseum and see it. What a magnificent thing. But it's like we're being in the Colosseum at Rome and all these great men and women of faith who are willing to give their life, they're shouting at you and encouraging you and saying, you can do it. If I endured what I endured, then you can endure it. If I can hang on, you can hang on. If I can accomplish what I accomplished and yet suffering and everything else, you can accomplish and you can stay faithful to the Lord. Wow. That's great. I mean, if he just stopped right there, that would be great encouragement of itself. That when I get down and I, I'm just discouraged and disappointed, just remember the great people in Hebrews 11 who went through far more than we'll ever go through in life. But he doesn't. He continues in the text. Uh, Notice now what he says. He says, okay, you remember. You want to hang in there when it gets tough. You remember the great men and women of Hebrews 11. And then he said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now, folks, sometimes we get discouraged and we get down and we want to give up because we haven't taken care of some things. And one, two things are mentioned here. He said, let us lay aside every weight. You know, there are a lot of things that weight us down. A lot of things we want to take with us. A lot of things, sometimes it can be a, a mental attitude. Sometimes it can be bitterness in our heart towards someone. It can be all kinds of things inwardly. It could be temptation. It could be, uh, as he mentions here, secondly, the sin which so easily it snares us. You know, sometimes in life, we say, Lord, I want to give you 98% of my life, but there's about 1% or 2% over here I sort of want to keep, you know. I like doing it. I want to keep it. And he says, look, you can never, ever be successful and keep going and never giving up until you get rid of the weight that's holding you down. Until you get rid of that sin which you want to hold on to and, and deal with in your life. And then notice what he says as he continues the passage there. He says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The Christian life, the Christian walk, the Christian run is not a hundred yard dash. It's a marathon. And I like to think of it as a marathon with hurdles about every 10 yards. You know, if there's something that we need, it's endurance. The King James says patience. And I think if there's something we need today in our walk with Christ, it's patience. Patience when it's easy to do the will of God and when it's not so easy. Patience to do the will of God when it's convenient and when it's not so convenient. Patience to do the will of God when it's popular and when it is not so popular. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. It is a long run. It is a long journey. All right? 
Now he continues. I mean, good information. You, you, you get down and, and, and you get discouraged. Don't forget those great men and women, Hebrews 11. And sometimes in our lives, there's some weights we carry. And, and if, we, if we decide to chunk it many times, it's because of sin in our life that we haven't dealt with. And always remember that it's a long haul. It's a marathon. But then notice the first part of verse 2. It gets even better, folks. I mean, it's great that you look to the great men and women in Hebrews 11 and see their faith and how they hung in there and didn't give up. But then he said, hey, let me give you something better. Looking unto Jesus. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say looking to the brethren. Folks, the brethren will disappoint you sometimes. It's just the way it is. We're all human. And the brethren will disappoint you and get you down and make you want to quit. But he didn't say look to the brethren. He didn't say look at the church. He didn't say look at the world. But he said, let me tell you, when you get down, you get discouraged, you say, I can't bear this way anymore. I'm the only one around here working, and, and I'm so discouraged. He says, you think about Jesus. You look unto Jesus. Now, why in the world? Why in the world do we look to Jesus? Well, he tells us. Watch this. He's the author, and he's the, watch that. He is the finisher of our faith. Think about that. He said, you want a good example? All those people in Hebrews 11, tremendous examples. But you look to Jesus if you want the best example of all. He was the author and the finisher of our faith. Folks, think about it. Jesus didn't give up on us. Jesus was a finisher. Jesus didn't give up on us. But sometimes in life, we give up on Him. I've often thought, what would it be like if, if Jesus had been like a lot of us? You know how we, we get our feelings hurt easily, how we get down and we just get worn out physically, we get worn out emotionally, we just get discouraged with people. I wonder what Jesus would have done if he'd been like a lot of us. Like in Luke chapter 4. Remember Luke 4? Why in Luke chapter 4, he goes into Nazareth, and he goes in there and he teaches. He reads from Isaiah, and he says, uh, uh, I'm the, uh, what you're looking at, that's what you're reading in Isaiah. And they got so mad. You remember they took him out to the brow, they were going to throw him out, they are going to kill Jesus. And he was able to escape there in Luke 4. You know, if Jesus had been like a lot of us, he just said, whoa, 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 I didn't buy into this. No, 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 no. I'm in a bad place here. Lord, bring me home. I am not going to put up with this. Lord, I'm, I'm down here in this world, and, and I'm hungry, and, and I'm not getting sleep like I ought to, and I miss heaven so much. If he didn't like a lot of us, he'd give it up. What about Matthew 4? You know, he's fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and then he faces the devil. If Jesus had been like a lot of us, he'd have said, whoa, 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 no, no, no I, I've had it. I don't deserve to be treated like this. And he could have said that and told the truth. But he didn't, did he? He kept giving us that tremendous example of being the author and the finisher of our faith. What about when he was before Herod? And there he's beaten, and then they make fun of him. They put this robe on him, and they make fun of him. If Jesus had been like a lot of us, he'd have given up. He said, no, I'm not going to the cross. No way. But he didn't. He was the author and the finisher of our faith. What about in Gethsemane? I mean, we know, you know, he, he has just... It sweats like great drops of blood, and he's praying, and he said, let your will be done, but Father, please let this cup pass. If there's some way, somehow, if Jesus has been like a lot of us, well, some of the little bitty things that get us all tore up and cause us to give up, he'd have said, that's it. No more. I've had it. He would have said, Father, you send angels down here. You take care of these people. These people are not worth it. 
I quit. But he didn't. So as he encourages these people, he says, man, you got, when you get down, remember those men and women in Hebrews 11, but most of all, you remember Jesus. He didn't give up on you. And you shouldn't give up on him. No matter, no matter what circumstances you find yourself in, no matter what people may say to you, no matter what people may do to you, no matter what comes in your life, he did not give up on you. Now, as you continue with the text, uh, as you continue with the text there, he says, for the joy that was set before him. Now, we could talk all night about that. Joy? Joy and dying on the cross? Well, there was some joy. Joy and being able to be back home in heaven. Joy to be back with the Father. But probably more than anything else, the joy of being able to finish the task of redeeming mankind. Now, watch this. You say, well, I haven't read anything about them wanting to quit. And you know, this discouragement stuff. And you making this stuff up? Oh, no. Watch verse 3. You see, he, now we understand why he said what he did in verse 1 and verse 2. For consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. How do you make that up? I got my outline from the verse there. He says, you remember Jesus. And that he's the author and the finisher. When you get discouraged in your soul, once again, I think the King James and New King James says, when you get discouraged in your mind. And usually that's where it starts, isn't it? It starts right up here. Someone says something or something happens or no one helps us or something happens in our life. And we say, I think I'm going to quit. I think I'm going to quit the church. I think I'm going to quit the Lord. Begins right here. He says, you think about Jesus. Now watch this, folks, in verse 4. He tells us in verse 4 the reason why none of us, not one of us, ever have a reason to say to the Lord, I quit. Here it is. You have not yet resisted the bloodshed striving against Sin. Wow. I'd like to be honest with you. I've never shed a drop of blood for the cause of Christ. I haven't. Anybody here? Anybody here been a martyr? Anybody here have had to shed any blood because of your faith? No. But there were men and women who did. And they stayed faithful. And the Son of God Himself did. And He stayed faithful. And He's saying, who are we? Who are we? When we, someone may laugh at us, someone may mock us, someone may do things sometimes, but we've never shed a drop of blood and we get all upset and tore up and we say, I've had it. I give up. I quit. Wow. What a powerful, powerful passage. When I think of this, I think of some people who did quit in the Bible. We don't have time to go through all of them. Let me mention one or two. You know this passage. For Demas, Paul would have to write to this young preacher, Timothy. Some of the hardest words probably he wrote to Timothy. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. That's one of, the, one of the reasons why many people give up. They love the world more than they love the Lord. Now, I, that's sad. Demas has forsaken me. By the way, you look up Demas when you get home. Demas is mentioned about three times in the New Testament. And he's mentioned, and the other times he's mentioned, he's mentioned in a list of characters. And they were strong Christian people. He's listed in a list in the New Testament with Luke. So this is what, this is not a person who, uh, his Christianity was shallow. This was a person who had traveled with these people. This was a person who was strong in the faith. But then Paul has to say, Demas has quit. 
Demas has given up. Now, what we sometimes do, like I'm doing tonight, we give old Demas a fit. We say, well, how, how, how could you do this, Demas? How in the world? I mean, here you are. You, could, you travel with Luke and some of these. You are right there in the heat in the midst of all the tremendous growth and the spreading of the gospel in the first century. How in the world could you quit? But let me ask you, uh, is Demas any worse than we are? When we throw up our hands and we say, I quit. What about this passage in John 6, 66? It says, Many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Oh, I'm so thankful Jesus wasn't like a lot of us. Because, you know, if Jesus had been like a lot of us, when this happened, oh, there were a lot of people following him. All of a sudden he turns around and many of them have gone. And now he and just a few are doing the work. Well, if Jesus has been like a lot of us, he said, that's it. He'd start murmuring and he'd stop, start complaining, you know, about such a, such a small group. But he didn't. Why? Because he's the author and the finisher. And once again, we can, we can look at these people in a class or when we're reading and say, how could they do that? They saw Jesus. They heard Jesus. They saw the miracles that Jesus... How in the world could they walk no more with Jesus? Well, again, the same question. Are we any worse? Are they, is they, these people any worse than we are? When we say, I've had it. I quit. But enough of the negative stuff. Let, let's look at the, at the time we have remaining and some people who did quit in the Bible, who didn't give up. Go to Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah, yeah, I hope you read and study the prophets of the Old Testament. So enriching. I'm telling you, it's unbelievable what they went through. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah would go out and preach repentance, repentance, and, and he would cry over the people, and, and nobody responded. They took Jeremiah, they put him in prison. They put him in stocks. They beat Jeremiah. They made fun of him so much. And one day, he got like we get sometimes. And he said, enough is enough. He talks to the Lord and he says, oh Lord, you induced me. And I was persuaded. You're stronger than I and I have prevailed. I am derision daily, every day. Everyone mocks me. For when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted violence and blunder. Because a word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. I'm suffering every day, Lord. So he said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. You know what he said? I give up. I give up. But then notice what he said. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. He couldn't. He couldn't do it. Even all the things that he was going through, even though he thought, as we all do sometimes, can I bear this by myself? Can I continue on? He didn't give up. You're talking about the prophets. Well, I'm talking about the prophets. Look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel, they did Ezekiel the same way they did Jeremiah. Put him in prison. Be a, Jer, Ezekiel would get his scroll, and he'd go out every day, and he'd preach the word. He'd cry out. He never had one. He didn't have one response. Every day, the old prophet of God would get up, and he'd go out, and he'd come home. No response. He'd preach all day long. One afternoon, one night, as he's coming home, he maybe the Bible doesn't say this, but I wonder if as he approached home, he didn't see the light in the house like he usually does. Maybe he didn't smell the bread that's usually cooking when he comes home from preaching all day. And as he gets closer to home, Someone says, Ezekiel, i got some bad news for you. Your wife died today. Now, you know, if it, 
if there's ever a reason to quit, maybe that would be it. But notice what the text says. So I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died, and the next morning, what did you do? I did as I was commanded. Wow. You go to the New Testament, you look at Peter and John. Remember in, in, in Acts 3, they're going to the temple, and, and uh, there they're uh, heal a lame man, and, and, and people started gathering around, and they started preaching and teaching, and there were 5,000 men uh, alone that were, uh, were baptized. And they, and, they, and they took them. They got all torn up about that, and they took them to the council. And remember what the council said to them? The council said, don't you speak any more in their name. They threatened them. And they said, don't you do it. Don't do it. And we remember what they did, Acts 4, 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They didn't give up. They didn't quit. Even when their lives were threatened, they didn't do it. Then I, I think of there are many others. We could talk about John, the baptizer. But uh, let's think about this one. The great apostle Paul. You see him now. He's in the Mamertine prison. I had the opportunity to be in that prison. It's a little different than what it used to be. It used to be. Well, it's still a hole in the ground, but... It, there was a stone up here with a circle and they let the, the prisoners down. It's a little different now. But here's the great apostle Paul. And uh, he's given his life. He's been beaten. He's been pickled in the Mediterranean Sea. All kinds of horrible things were done to the apostle Paul. Left for dead. Here he is now, an old soldier. He asked for his parchment, and he asked for his pen. He says, I'm going to write a letter. And he writes to Timothy. You remember he wrote to Timothy? And he said, as he takes and he begins to write, he said, Timothy, he says, quit preaching. Give up. Well, if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to be in this place where I am, and you're going to lose your life just like me. You say, I know uh, he didn't do that. No, he didn't. There he is in that dungeon, and maybe rats are running around. There's a stench you can't get used to. And maybe outside the prison, outside that Mamertine prison, he hears a swish, swish, swish. And someone laughs and says, Oh, you, they're sharpening the sword for tomorrow. Your head comes off. What does he write, that young preacher? He begins in verse 1 of 2 Timothy 4, and he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth. And they'll be led into fables. Watch therefore in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelists. For I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing and his kingdom. You think about that. In his direst need, in his greatest hour, that old preacher of God did not quit. Let's see, I may have, is the bell rung? <clears throat> How much? Five? Five minutes. Folks, a lot more I could say, and our time's gone. Let me end like this. <clears throat> we have to understand something. 
won't forget it. It was a circle of young preachers. It was an old preacher, and all the young preachers talking about how bad they had it, you know, how hard it was hard for them to pay for their suits and, you know, pay for their Cadillacs and all this stuff, you know. And the old preacher just listened and listened to finally he had enough. He sort of stepped out in the middle of them and he said, gentlemen, I want you to know something. It's a privilege to serve my Lord. Then he turned and he walked away. You know, that's what it is. It's a privilege. When I can begin to understand that, then I can begin to deal with this discouragement. When I can begin to understand that Jesus finished for me, and I need to finish for Him. I won't forget it. I was, Clarence Walls was one of our deacons, and Clarence uh, was in benevolence, and he helped so many people, and I could just talk all night about Clarence. There was a big article in the Decatur Daily years ago about him, the Good Samaritan of Hartzell, and and, and, and Clarence just was happy, and, and he was helping people, and he worked at the building all the time as far as he was an electrician. He'd do all kind of stuff at the building. And I just asked him one, I said, Clarence, I said, sit down here, man. He was up the building working, and he was just, you know, just so happy in his service. And I wanted what he had. And I said, Clarence, I said, you run around here, and you enjoy what you do. And I said, I know people all the time on your case about this, and, and I know this is... Got, I know you got these family issues. Clarence, how do you keep an attitude? Why is it you always want to serve and you're always doing and you just keep going? And he looked at me and he said this. He said, Philip, he said a long time ago, the people in this church came out to my house and talked to me about Jesus and I ran out in the woods. And he did. He said, but you know they didn't give up on me. And he said, you don't want my Jesus. He didn't give up on me. And there was a tear that started to roll down his cheek. He said, well, he said, all this stuff I do, all this stuff I do, I'm up here by myself, that's fine. All this stuff I do and helping people and whatever. He says, listen, man. He says, it's nothing. It is nothing compared to what he did for me. Now when I can understand that and I can grasp that, then when I do get down and I get discouraged, I don't want to give up on him. Because what he did is far greater than anything I could do for him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time and your word tonight. We thank you for this great church. We just pray you bless each and every one here tonight. We know that all of us go through our discouragement. We go through our highs and our lows in serving you. But help us always remember these great people in Hebrews 11. And help us remember your son. And that he didn't give up on us. And help us to never give up on him. Help us to take this message into our life through this week and through the rest of our life. And give us what we need to be what we need to be in your service. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.